I'm looking for uh, the Rosenthal family who are here now. There's Ellen, uh, Ellen Stevens Rosenthal, her son Mick, and daughter Jane. Dr. Zhao acknowledged the important contribution that the Rosenthals have, have made in this series and in many other ways. Uh, and uh, they did arrive during Dan Ariel's uh, presentation this morning, uh, but they weren't present when uh, he acknowledged them. So again, please acknowledge uh, the Rosenthal fam family for their important contributions. Uh, back to this particular panel. Uh, there's Brent. I thought he'd vaporized for a moment. Uh, Brent James is the moderator of this panel. Uh, he has made many, many contributions. Again, everybody's bio uh, is in your, uh, is, is available out on, on the desk there. Uh, I want to particularly acknowledge Brent's role in the University of Texas. We have six health campuses and have now added uh, two new medical schools. Uh, and we wanted to work on patient safety and clinical effectiveness. So we called upon Brent, who gives a course uh, at his institution, which is a remarkable course. The participants not only have didactic sessions, but they must do a project uh, to improve clinical effectiveness and safety. With his help, uh, we have had over uh, almost 2,000 faculty and, and administrators in the University of Texas complete that course, which we give on all of our campuses. We've done well over 650 projects to improve health and safety. As a consequence of that, we've been able to uh, integrate issues related to patient safety and clinical effectiveness throughout all of our campuses. And two years ago, we started a new initiative involving industrial engineering and systems engineering. This is an area that's very underused in this country. Uh, the industrial engineers think that the health industry doesn't know what they're doing because they've not applied any of those industrial principles. The health community thinks that it's all about uh, industry and doesn't realize that the methodologies are profound so that one of the next steps is for many institutions would be to, in fact, uh, I implement a serious program in uh, in systems engineering using industrial engineers. But uh, Brent, I want to thank you for the help that you provided in moving the University of Texas along and turn the program over to you and you introduce your folks. Thank you, Ken, and good morning. I think we have a very interesting session for you. We represent industry and what's happening with patient safety out in the larger world. I'm going to be the glass is at least half full kind of a guy. But I wanted to prevent, present to you a few framing issues just to get started, so very, very rapidly. The first, it's easy to make the case on the evidence that healthcare delivery today is the best the world has ever seen. The evidence is overwhelming. Um, better than that, experienced by any previous generation of people alive on this planet. Um, it adds about three and a half to seven years minimally to the life expectancy of every member of our society. Having said that, it's also easy to make the case that it could be much better. It's the duty of every generation of the healing profession is to pass along something better than we ourselves receive. The first step in that is to understand where the opportunities lie. And I would argue that's what Terry Schumann really did. It opened to the profession, opened to the world, a massive opportunity for improvement for making it much, much better. Um, it's the idea that the care that we deliver while effective is innately dangerous. Any treatment that's powerful enough to heal can also harm. As anyone who's practiced medicine, nursing, pharmacy, any element of care delivery understands, often a very thin line between help and harm, and it's almost impossible, it feels sometimes, to avoid stepping over that line. Very, very hard. Now, just one quick review, one kept quick idea. There are two opposing forces in play when we assess patient safety nationally. I'm disappointed when I saw that New England Journal article that said that we hadn't made any progress. I disagree. I think we have made progress. The two factors, though, that are acting in conjunction with one another, even as I think care has become safer, are ability to detect injury events 
in care delivery settings has also increased dramatically. Just to illustrate, when we published Ares Human, the source of that gripping statistic, Harvard Medical Practice Study, if you extrapolated that to the country as a whole, 98,000 avoidable deaths per year. Utah, Colorado, we took Lucian Troy's method from Harvard Medical Practice, got some help from Eric Thomas, one of their junior faculty, and I think replicated it almost perfectly out in Utah as part of a project that we had running there. That's what led to 44,000. Some years later though, 2004 data, uh, Dom Berwick supported uh, Dave Klass and Roger Rassar, a number of others, in developing a better tool for detecting injuries. It's called the IHI Global Trigger Tool, the GTT. I'm just gonna show our hospital's component of that. We actually had three big, famous patient safety hospitals participate, about 1,000 patients. Yeah, well, Harvard Medical Practice Studies showed that 3.7% of patients were injured as part of their care, while Utah, Colorado said 2.9%. The global trigger tool showed 26% of all patients had some sort of a care-associated injury, at least one, during their course of hospitalization that was attributable to their care during the index hospitalization. In fact, a fellow named John James, no relation, used those data to estimate 200,000 preventable deaths per year. Uh, so you have two factors happening at once. Our ability to see the events has been increasing. At the same time that I believe the base rates have probably been decreasing. And one of the things you're going to see from this panel is that idea, the progress that we've made. Now, just a couple of other ideas. Realize that safety events are usually invisible to most of the people associated with them, particularly the professional teams. One study that really stands out in my mind, Dr. Jonathan Nebaker at the VA, he was looking at the most common source of patient injuries, adverse drug events, drug reactions, overdoses, drug-drug interactions. He had a rigorous methodology for identifying those events when they did occur. Over 80% of the time when he took the actual proven events back to the clinical team delivering the care, the team had not connected the patient's symptoms to the drug. They never made the connection. They were invisible. And in fact, in some cases, in some instances where people had died from a drug event, members of the team argued with him that it couldn't possibly have been that drug. And with a thorough review, it clearly was. Now, now this has some implications. We have different ways of detecting events when they do occur. This was the second IOM committee, patient safety established a new standard for care that Janet Corrigan led here at the IOM. Um, yeah, we pointed out that many times, well, three ways of, of detecting Many times if you rely upon voluntary reporting for health professionals, for patients, for family members, for others, to see the event, you'll miss most of them. Just one illustration out of that same formal study of the IHI Global Trigger Tool, at LDS Hospital, we estimated that that year they should have reported 134 significant safety events, SSEs, the big category. That year they reported nine with one of the better tracking systems in existence. And that kind of a finding has been re replicated again and again and again, if you see the idea behind it. So, so the, the principle is, is that many times they're invisible. And even as we've increased our ability to detect, in some sense it's overshadowed the fact that I think we're developing a really a, a better care delivery environment. Um, so one last idea. Two ways of thinking about it. This is really what I think our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Ariely, was talking about. Do you think about patient safety as regulatory compliance or as the core of care delivery operations at a systems level? Um, I've discovered, at least as I've approached this within the areas where I've worked, it usually works better if you approach it as an opportunity as opposed to a bill of indictment. You show health professionals that it's possible to be better. It makes a difference. They care about the people that they care for. And in some sense, when you do regulatory compliance, it becomes a gotcha. It becomes a negative. Um, how would we think about doing it where it was an opportunity for better as opposed to a punishment for bad? Well, with that, 
three speakers. I'm going to introduce each one of them. They're going to come to the podium and um, describe their work. Uh, so a very brief introduction. The full details are in your handouts. Uh, Dr. David Pryor is the Executive Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at Ascension Health. Um, Ascension Health is currently the largest private healthcare system in the United States, over 130 hospitals. And so the size of that system and its geographic spread makes his accomplishments even more noteworthy. Dr. Matt McHugh, sorry. Um, Matt, you're one of those fellows who have way too much education, <laughs> I have to say. Um, yeah, the RN and MPH, a PhD, and then the JD somehow snuck in there too. The Rosemary Greco term endowed associate professor in advocacy at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. So Matt's nurse, nurse is going to talk, talk to us about the nursing view of patient safety. And then first up, um, Dr. Kurt Calhoun, native of Chicago, an internist by training, uh, but Dr. Calhoun is currently the president of UT Health Northeast. Uh, his presence at UT Health Northeast has resulted in a complete turnaround of that institution from one that was struggling financially and in significant crisis as a public hospital, public safety net hospital, to one that is recognized by many, including the University of Texas system, for its commitment to excellence and financial self-discipline. So Dr. Calhoun, and then we'll just take 10 minutes apiece and we'll just go in order. <laughs> 